Hello, and welcome to Health and Fitness Redefined. I'm your host, Anthony Amen. Join me today as we take a dive into the world of health and fitness, where we're learning to overcome adversity, to pick back first fiction, and see health and fitness in a whole new light. Welcome, guys, to this lovely January edition. Today, you get all of this guy. I thought it would be fun today to do a nice different type of style of episode where I'm going to just go through a list of commonly asked questions I get as a trainer. Because a lot of the times what I've realized is people always have the same questions and they get asked a hundred times. So I figured why not make an episode where I can send my lovely clients to maybe it's some of you guys and help out everybody to answer these questions. So you always have something to refer back to. So today's episode, frequently asked questions I get as a personal trainer. And if you guys think I missed something, throw it in those comments, reach out to me directly, and I'd be happy to answer them for you. So without further ado, question number one, what is the quickest way to lose weight? This is definitely the the most asked question. I get a bunch of people that come in and they go, hey, I want to lose 50 pounds in two weeks. Help. Well, unfortunately, it's not an easy answer to give. But I will say this, and you've heard it if you listen to the show, a very common theme. The best way to lose weight is to keep moving and doing something. Literally anything. Don't take it as just going to the gym. Maybe it's going for a walk. Maybe it's going for a bike ride, just being outside, doing some yard work. There's a whole bunch of things that you can do to help you lose weight that involves more than just going to the gym, going home, and sitting all day. On top of that, it does heavily play into diet. Also, yet again, don't go to those lovely diets that we've talked about on the show before, your ketos and your paleos and whatever the hell else there is. Focus on just eating foods you enjoy, but eating them in moderation and having a heavy focus on foods that we know that are good for us. For example, fruits and veggies. Eating more fruits and veggies throughout your day is going to help you function better. Maybe it'll help give you more energy to go out and do those walks that will really ultimately help you burn some calories and lose some weight. Full disclosure on this, anything that says they will help you lose 50 pounds in two weeks is a farce. Don't do it. There's always repercussions when it comes to things like that. For example, fat burners. Fat burners send more people to the ER than most other things. Just something to think about. They are horrible for our bodies. Not true. A fat burner that works is going outside and going for a walk. Really, really simple. So that is, in my opinion, the quickest way to lose weight. And if you want more information, hop back into some previous shows where we talked about a whole various different topics. All right, moving on. What days should I work out? And how long should I work out for? Yet again, this is going to be dependent on what you want to achieve out of the gym, whether you want to lose weight, you want to build muscle, you're doing it for endurance training. There's A wide array of topics of how long and what days should somebody work out. Long story short, the answer really quick is just keep moving. Life in motion is going to be what can help you out. Whatever you can afford to do, do. You can go for half an hour, go for half an hour. You can go for 45 minutes, go for 45 minutes. Whatever you can prioritize and fit into your schedule is going to be ultimately the best answer. If you want to go a little more into detail for those that are looking to maybe build some muscle on their bodies or they really are, they really work out, but they want to learn more, the what days I should work out depends on what kind of split you're doing. There's different variations to work different muscles. So let's say on Monday, you're doing upper body. And then on Tuesday, you're doing lower body. So you can have an upper Lower rest day, upper, lower rest day. That's one definition of one type of split. There's also other ways we call them the bro splits, where we're doing chest and tries together, then we're going to back and buys, then we're hopping the next day into core, then we're doing legs, 
and then a focus on arms because that's why it's called the bro split. So that's another variation of a different kind of split you can do. My advice with this, guys, is two things. One, the golden rule for exercise is if you're trying to build strength and put on muscle, your muscles need 48 hours to recover. I'm going to repeat that, 48 hours to recover. So let's say you're doing chest on a Monday. It's advisable you don't do chest at least again till Wednesday, if not even Thursday. So you can fit a lot of muscle. You can work opposites, though. So you're working chest on a Monday. You can work back on Tuesday, but I would not advise working those same muscle groups two days in a row. Give it 48 hours. It gives your muscles enough time to heal because yet again in the gym, you aren't building muscle. You are tearing muscle, and it needs to grow. You tearing that muscle is causing inflammation response. That inflammation response is why, like, wow, look at my biceps. Look how good they look. That's because your muscle is inflamed. Same thing as if you stubbed your toe. So little advice on that. The second thing is don't stay in the same split. Our bodies need to be confused. Our brains are extremely lazy. They will look for to submit the least amount of energy necessary to work out. So if you're doing the same thing over and over again with the same workouts, it's going to become very easy. You're not going to get sore and you're not going to see as great results. I personally switch my splits every three months and I always vary based upon what my goals are for that time of year. On a quick side note, the most important, this is for my guys, all right? Just full disclosure, men listening to this show, legs are the most important muscle group. I know. I know you want to lose weight. You want to build muscle. The biggest muscle in your body is your gluteus maximus and therefore should be worked the most out of any muscle in your body. The more muscle you have in your body, the more your higher metabolism or the higher your BMR. So the more weight you can lose and the more for men, the more testosterone you have in your body based upon working that bigger muscle. So your gluteus maximus is important and your quadriceps, AKA legs, Make sure you work them at least two days a week. Moving on, what is the best time of day to work out? Now, yet again, (laughs) whatever you can fit into your schedule, guys, is always the best time of day to work out. But if you want to get down to the nitty-gritty science of it, they did an awesome study on PubMed of when we have the most energy output, and it was shown to bid midday right before lunchtime. So it's usually between two and three hours after you work out is the most power you can get in the exercises, the most weight you can lift. So if you're really going for power and strength, I highly recommend sticking between that 10 and 11 o'clock time to work out. You're going to be able to put a lot more power output into it. Worst time of day is always right before bed. A mixed group of studies have showed that working out three hours for bedtime can actually make you not enter deep REM sleep. Of course, go do your own research on that. Look into that a little further. But ultimately, whenever you can work out, go work out. End of story. Next question. What should I be focusing on while working out? I made this a very broad question because it encompasses a lot of things. First and foremost, if you ever come to my gym, the thing you'll hear me say the most is breathe. You need to breathe. Something called a Valsalsa mover was when you bear it down and go and we've all done it before, is great if you're an AFib, but besides that, you should not be doing that. It is not ideal while working out. You need to be focusing on your breathing. General rule of thumb is you exhale on exertion. So a chest press, for example, if I'm pushing that weight up, that's the exertion part of that chest press. So I'm breathing out as, and then on the way down, taking a deep breath in, and I'm focusing that between every single rep. So exhale on exertion is something you should be focusing on while working out. Another thing you should be focusing on is envisioning that muscle. There's something called the mind-to-muscle connection. And I see it a lot with beginners, and I'm sure a lot of people have experienced this. You're doing a chest fly, for example, and you're not feeling it in your chest. That's because your body hasn't built that neural pathway to recognize that this exercise is pulling from your chest muscle. So it's important to think about what area you're working and really try to feel it in that location. This is where understanding physiology comes into a point because I know a chest fly is working my chest. I'm gonna be really able to activate my chest 
and get that muscle fired up. So I'm really going to focus on pulling from that as opposed to any secondary muscles that may be supporting me because I know ultimately I want to feel that in my chest. So I'm really going to focus there. So that's what you should be focusing on while working out. Moving on. How much cardio should I be doing? Cardio is extremely important for your cardiovascular system, hence the name cardio. <laughs> so please be aware to make sure you are doing some cardio while working out. It doesn't have to be what everyone thinks it is, which is just running. You can do something we call HIIT training or high intensity interval training. This is when we're doing our cardiovascular training while doing our strength training is a two in one. We're getting our heart rate up as we're weightlifting and that is working our cardiovascular system. Some people make the mistake in doing too much cardio. I like to call it in my intro packet to my clients, the cardio trap. What does that mean? If you ever look at long distance runners and people where all they do is run, they have no muscle on their body. They are twigs. Now what happens, and you see this unfortunately with females a lot, is they start running, running, running. They jump a bunch of weight. They're super happy. And then they take a couple of days off and they're like, wow, how did I gain this much weight? I only took a week off. Whereas their guy counterparts are weightlifting all this time. And then they're taking a week off and losing weight but not gaining weight and having this similar diet. The reason for that is that women tend to have less muscle than men. And when you're focusing on cardio, cardio is not building muscle. So if you're just running on the treadmill, doing those long distance runs, you're actually going to end up burning your muscle stores after a certain point in that cardiovascular training. So you're going to have less and less and less of it because your body ideally for running less mus muscle means less weight. It's easier to run. So keep that in mind while you're running. Try not to do it, I would say, seven days a week. It really depends on, like I said, what you're trying to get out of your training. But if you want to ultimately lose weight and be able to take a weekend or off or a week off and not have to worry about gaining it back, always incorporate more weight training into your exercise regimen and HIIT training would be ideal for that. So don't move past the cardio trap, as I call, and always look in to more information about how you can make cardio beneficial for you. Moving on, how can I build more muscle? You exercise. <laughs> no, but really, weight training is how you're going to build muscle. Working your anaerobic system, there's a difference between anaerobic and aerobic. Aerobic is cardiovascular. Anaerobic just means without oxygen. This is preferred to weight training. So, while you're exercising, doing different forms of splits, the idea, like I mentioned before, is to tear your muscles. What you want to do is put enough strain using levers, because everything in your body is a lever, basically, to break down a muscle, put these little micro tears in it. Those micro tears are going to cause that inflammation response. And your body is going to say, hey, you know, I had this amount of strength and this amount of muscle fibers, and it, it, it still tore while this person was trying to do this thing. So, you know, maybe we should add more muscle fiber and make it thicker and stronger so it doesn't tear. So your body does that over the next 48 hours, which leads into that 48 hour rule, like I mentioned before, and it will build that muscle back bigger and stronger. You tear it again, it builds it back bigger and stronger and so on and so forth. So this is how you build muscle in a very simplistic term. For all of you people who are saying, uh, obviously, there's a lot more to it science-wise, but I'm going to keep this simple. So just something to think about moving on. Leading off of this question, I I've, didn't know what order to put these in, but I'll start with this one, is what supplements should I be taking? You hear this a lot from people trying to build a lot of muscle is probably where it's more tender. But people want to rely on something else. They think they need to reach for an outside source to bring it in. You really don't need supplements in your diet. I really truly believe that. But supplements do play a important role depending on what you want to get out of your exercise. So you want to capitalize on how much protein you're intake for a day, then supplement protein shakes. If you're not eating enough protein in a whole foods diet, I would recommend having protein. For example, 
I need to eat about 200 grams of protein a day. I can't get that through food. It's very difficult. I get very full. So I will supplement a protein shake in to really help me hit that target protein goals. But that's me. If you guys aren't interested in really building muscle, or you just want to stay healthy, you really don't need it. Another supplement that I would highly recommend, but obviously always do your research on everything is creatine. It is the most researched supplement on the market. That is fact. Go look it up. And it does has shown been to help in a lot of beneficial ways. There are basically no adverse effects to taking creatine as opposed to doing damage to your body. Unless you are the one person who ever went to the hospital for it because the guy was taking 10 times over the recommended daily allowance and wasn't drinking any water whatsoever. Well, creatine is something we all naturally produce while we sleep, and it is also found in red meats. So when we have creatine, it turns into creatine. The creatine saturates our muscles. It is the first line of ATP or energy used while we are lifting, meaning we can lift more weight. Ultimately, the goal when you're working in the gym is to get more weight up, to tear your muscles even further. So that is why it's going to help you build muscle. Creatine is going to draw a lot of water. So people call that water weight as you're drawing it to your muscles. You're going to get the sense that you're really dehydrated. And if you are taking creatine, it is important to make sure you up your water intake, guys. Please remember, keep your kidneys healthy. Up your water intake while you are supplementing with creatine. There are two different ways to do it. You have a loading phase, and then you have a stable phase. So loading phase, the idea is to get a lot more into your body. Taking more into your body makes it easier for your body to drench the muscle with the creatine, and then you can drop it down once you hit that time period. You can also just skip that phase altogether and take the lower amounts right off the get-go, especially if you're testing it. It will take longer to drench those muscles in creatine, but... Ultimately, over the course of a year, you're going to be about the same boat as someone who is loading and unloading. I like tank cake and creatine in the winter because, yet again, it does blow you. It does help you put on weight. And I don't care in the winter as much as I do the summer. So come March, April, I will get off creatine. I'll be able to drop weight a lot easier. I'll have a lot more muscle on my body because of the creatine, which helps me build the muscle, meaning my metabolic rate's a lot higher and it'll be easier for me to be where I want to be come the summer months. Besides that, there are thousands and thousands of supplements on the market. I could talk all day about this one. I would just say, get it from foods, guys. I wouldn't really look into other things. Most, most things you don't need. I will say one, which I really do like, just as a vitamin in itself, is vitamin D. Vitamin D3, to be particular, is what we get from the sun. If you live in a cold climate like I do here in New York, I do supplement vitamin D in the winter because I am not outside enough to get it from the sun. Vitamin D plays a really important role in helping our bones. It plays an important role in our immune systems. It's one of the reasons that we get sick in the winter, especially come flu season. It's flu season because we're not outside and we're coming inside. We're being more close contact with people and we don't have enough vitamin D in our systems. So keep that in mind. I would say if you live in a cold climate, you're definitely vitamin D deficient, but you can always go get blood work to figure that out. Moving on, how much protein should I be eating? So jury's out on this one, and I did an entire episode. I want you to go back, guys, and find that episode where I talked all about protein, how much you should be taking. But I'll summarize it really quickly for you. Yet again, depends on what your goals are. Some people don't end up needing enough. Some people eat too much. Rule of thumb speaking, if you're trying to build muscle as a male, you want to be between the 0.8 and 1.0 grams per pound. So if you weigh 200 pounds as a male, you want to be anywhere between that 180 and 200 grams of protein a day. Hope that makes sense. For females, that range drops a little more. You guys don't need as much. That's between the 0.6 and 0.8 if you're trying to build muscle on your body. So do that math, figure out your weight, times it by 0.6 or 0.8, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Ultimately, though, if you just want to have enough just to be healthy, women can sit down to that point of it or that point four range. Men can go all the way to 0.6 to 0.7 just to give you a rough range of how many grams per pound you should be in taking it. Again, that is grams per pound. For those that may live in other countries and use a different system, you can look at the grams to kilograms 
measurement off because it is different. That's how much protein you should be taking. A rule of thumb, protein pacing, our bodies can only digest a certain amount of protein at a time. So while eating, don't think I'm going to have 200 grams of protein in one sitting. It's really not doing it any good. You're going to pee and your pee is going to be nice and frothy. <laughs> Pace it out. Stick between that 30 and 40 grams of protein per hour, depending on what you're trying to hit. That's why I do love protein shakes as a little supplement so I can put it in between meals for myself. All right. Moving on. A little different of a question. What's my target heart rate? What is target heart rate? A lot of us are just starting to understand that heart rate zones are prevalent into how we exercise and move. This has come from Fitbits, the oldest trackers we wear in our body. We're always seeing our heart rate, but a lot of us don't know what it means. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what heart rate zones are, what you should look at, what you should be concerned about. We'll go from there. Rule of thumb with measuring something we called your max heart rate. How high should your heart rate go? It's 220 minus your age. So if I was 20 years old, I would do 220 minus my age, so 220 minus 20. My max heart rate should be 200. That doesn't mean I'm getting to 200 beats per minute. What I need to figure out after this is what's my resting heart rate. How do you figure out your resting heart rate? Really simple. If you're wearing a tracker, it will tell you for you. Most people range between that 40 and 80 beats per minute. That is healthy. If your resting heart rate's above that, please go consult the doctor. But anyway, 40 to 80 is that healthy range. You can also measure it right when you get up. Find your pulse, either up in here on your neck or on your wrist. Use a clock, count for 60 seconds, and you're going to have how many beats of heart beats per minute. Or like I said, we all wear trackers now. So once we figure out what our resting heart rate is, then we can figure out our target heart rate zones. So zones will depend on what kind of training you want to do. We have anaerobic, which I mentioned before, it's without oxygen. Aerobic, which is with oxygen. So we have an idea of where we want to be. I love training hit interval style when it comes to working cardiovascular system. It helps with the cardiovascular output. What that means is I'm going to take my heart rate from that 60% of my max all the way up to my 80 Hold it there for a minute, bring it back down to 60, go back up to 80, go back down to 60. I'm going to arrange in that little circle there going on. It's going to help train your heart rate in different heart rate zones. How do you figure this out? Just back to the formula we were using before. Once you get your max heart rate, you take your max heart rate, you minus off your resting heart rate, whatever that may be, and you get a number. Let's say that number, the difference between those two is 100. So I want to work... 80% of my max, I'm going to do 100 times 80%. I'm going to get 80. I'm going to take 80. I'm going to add my resting heart rate back into 80. If my resting heart rate was 40, that'll put me up to 120 beats per minute is going to be my 80% marker. Obviously, that math equation is way off for because no one's really in that range. But figure it out. So yet again, 220 minus your age gets you your max. After you get that max, you figure out your resting when you wake up in the morning. You minus your max, minus what your resting is. That gives you a range. You figure out how high you want to be in that range. So let's say it's 80%. Take that number, times it by 80%, and then add your resting heart rate back into that number, and that will give you your heart rate range. Hope that helps. And just don't forget, guys, you want to work in different heart rate zones to help ultimately train your heart. Sometimes you want to work in an aerobic zone, which is that 60 to 70%. Sometimes you want to work in an anaerobic zone, which is above 80. I mean, it's very hard to maintain because, like I said, it's without oxygen. So something to think about when you talk about heart rate zones. If you want, I'll be happy to do a future episode more about heart rates. Throw it in the comments. Reach out to me. Let me know. And I'll be happy to help and maybe dive deep into this topic a little bit more. Moving on. Last question. What does my soreness mean? A lot of people get sore after they work out and they always complain. We call it in the industry DOMS. DOMS stands for delayed onset muscle soreness, meaning I'm working out. I'm not sore right after that, but I'm sore a couple of days later. You'll probably notice this goes along with some other things in life. It's not completely relatable, but it's good for an analogy, which is let's say I hit my head. My head usually doesn't hurt right after that. Or get into a car accident, I'm not in pain right after that. I'm usually in pain later that night or the next morning. It's the same thing with your muscles. 
It's not the same reason, but it's just a good analogy. Something to think about is that, like I said, you're tearing your muscles in the gym. That's the point of it. And then usually 12 hours later, you start feeling it. And by 48 hours later, you're like, oh my gosh, my legs really hurt. I just squatted too much. That's perfectly okay. Soreness is perfectly acceptable. They used to think soreness came from a lactic acid buildup in your muscles. They actually have since disproven that theory. No one really knows ultimately why we get sore, but we can make an assumption stating that it's probably has something to do with the fact we're tearing our muscles, our body's healing the muscles, letting us know it's sore. That's what's giving those kind of aches and pains. It is perfectly normal to feel some relative soreness. You never want to be in a state where you can't move because that defeats the purpose of working out. So when you are working out, just keep that in mind. I want to get sore where I, enough where I feel it, but I don't want to be stuck in bed because I am so sore I can't move. So always listen to your body because it really understands about what it's capable of handling. You know more about you than anybody else out there. So if I'm feeling really achy and sore one day and I'm waking up because I worked out too hard in the gym, I'm taking the next day off. This goes into something I talked about is how many times a day should I be working out or how many times a week you should be working out. This is why you shouldn't work out every single day. They're actually showing more and more that three to five days per week is ideal for most people. And that, what I mean by that is working out in the gym. That excludes going for walks, walks you should do every single day. But really hitting your body hard, do that between three and five days a week. Don't forget to take rest days. Working out in the gym every single day is not good for you. It's going to have some ill effects on the body. So listen to your body. If you're really sore, use it as your rest day. But you're ultimately keeping yourself moving like that. On top of that, guys, something to keep in mind too. Every three months, you should take at least three to seven days off from working out altogether. It gives your body time to refuel itself, heal itself, get over any injuries that you may or may not have. So I do like that question. I'm going to throw another one in here that I didn't put on because I don't get asked too often, but... I just want to explain it coming from a trainer's point of view, and that is how to start an exercise program. Like I've always said, it's always important to start. Always talk to a professional. Talk to your trainers. Make sure your trainers have some kind of certification behind them showing that they actually understand what they're talking about. Talk to your doctor about it. But you never want to just go from not working out to trying to be a power lifter. There's a step process. We spoke to NASM about this, about how you should go about exercising. Always start with working your stabilizer muscles. Once you get your stabilizer muscles down, look for some under and overactive. Sometimes you're really tight in an area and really weak in another area. Train those areas that really weaken, stretch those areas really tight in, and really work your body in a balance. You don't want to jump into heavy lifting or heavy power movements because you're ultimately just going to end up getting hurt. Then you're going to be out of the gym for the next three to six months. Your medical bills are going to be at the roof. You don't, that's something you want to deal with, and it's a giant headache. So start slow and steady. Talk to a professional. Tell them what's going on. Maybe they can watch your gait pattern as you walk. You don't even notice it, but maybe your hip internally rotates. I see that as a trainer. I know I need to work at externally rotating your hips a little better. Then we build those muscles. And then once we're able to your body, get your body mechanics in order, then we can slowly start progressing up to what you want to be doing but it does take time. Everything in life takes time, but you've got to start somewhere. Start from the beginning, take it day by day, and ultimately you'll be able to hit your goals. I didn't start doing crazy stuff in the gym my first year. I started with one pound weights, guys. So just keep that in mind. It takes time, but you will get there if you constantly put in the work. If I missed any questions or anything you want to talk about further, reach out to me. You can get a hold of me at a health fitness redefined podcast at gmail.com you could also find me through redefined fitness guys i love doing these episodes because i really just get straight to the facts and thank you for joining us on this week's episode of health and fitness redefined don't forget hit that subscribe button and join us next week as we dive deeper into this ever-changing field and remember fitness is a journey not a destination until next time